for us to um, consider our planet, consider our own lives, consider even our neighbors and what's happening around us because there's needs all over the world. So please continue to pray there, continue to pray for Myanmar and what is happening there as well. Okay, we are turning to our text this morning, and I want to remind us of the overarching theme of this entire series. It's summed up this way, trust God's promises, that's the first part. We are called to trust God's promises, and I'm intentionally throughout this series following that line of reasoning, where is God's promises and how are people responding to these promises and how do these things, when they match up, make a difference and how, when they are not matched up, how that makes a negative difference as well. So trust God's promises, well, how? By living. Okay. And when we are trusting and we believe something internally, It is seen through us externally. If you say you believe something, and yet our life is incongruent, that is, does not match with what we believe, then what do we really believe? What we really believe is, should be, must be, will be demonstrated by how we live. Now granted, at times in in our lives, we don't necessarily match up well. (laughs) We want to serve God and we don't always do that well. Thank the Lord for his mercy, his forgiveness, and his helping us to get back on track. So trust God's promises. How? By living a life of faith. And when we look at the account of Abram, Sarai, Abraham, Sarah, we look at their story. And I want you to recognize what's true about God from the Bible. Every time you read, I hope that you are praying, God, open my eyes to what is true about you. And then in response, we say, God, help me to know what to do. What is true, and then what is true. To do. I want to remind you when you read the scripture, when you hear a message, when you are listening to things, ask those questions. And so we ask them of this text and we see not just this story, but what God is doing through the story of the Bible, through creation and through the fall and through his redemption and restoration. Good for us to remind these things. And so our text this morning is a heavy text. It's dealing with Sodom, it's dealing with Gomorrah, and this is what we're going to look at. And if I was going to put a, the sermon in a sentence, okay, we're, we're actually dealing with this subject, excuse me, righteousness and justice in this passage, when it comes to both wrath and the mercy of God. So we're seeing God's righteousness and his justice. And we see it demonstrated in both God's wrath and his mercy. This was true then and it is true about God to this day and we'll see this demonstrated to its full extent on the day of judgment. Sermon in a sentence. God is righteous and just. Thank you. These things come out of who God is. He is both righteous and just. And we, if you are his child, we as God's children by faith are to do what is righteous and just. There's a lot packed into that sentence. And let me give you a fairly dense paragraph that I'm going to unpack in this message. As God's people, we are called to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is both right and just. 
aunt. We are to direct our children and our households to do the same. We'll see this directly from our text today. Now, doing so brings a blessing to both the neighborhood and the nations. Double immediate context and greater context of the world. So when we do what is right and just, there is a blessing to our neighborhood and a blessing to the nations that comes both presently and also permanently when we're dealing with the things of eternity. God does distinguish between the acts of righteousness and the acts of wickedness seen in both his mercy and his judgment. God will deliver his people from his wrath and deliver his wrath on the wickedness of people. Unrighteous actions will not, cannot, do not produce righteous results. That is a very dense paragraph. So we're going to break this down from our text. It's a large chunk of text today. I'm not going to read it all. I encourage you to read it all. I'm going to have to sum up some parts of it. So the first thing I want us to remember, the first major point for us to do, to know, number one, is that we have a calling to keep the way of the Lord. We're going to see that from this text. So we are in Genesis chapter 18, starting with verse 16. And if you remember from last week, and if you've been with us, we're following the life of these, this couple and what God is doing to them, what God is doing with them, what God is doing through them. And the angel of the Lord, which is an Old Testament appearance of Christ, flanked by two men who are really angels. And by the way, <laughs> angels don't have wings. There's a certain set of angels that have wings. Okay. Most angels do not. There is the seraphim and the cherubim, which you'll see in Scripture. Those have wings. But most, most angels, the rank and file angels, okay, when they appear on earth, people think they're humans. Okay. Just saying. <laughs> So Christ the Lord, flanked by two angels, met with Abraham. We saw this last week. We saw Abraham's heart and made us evaluate our own heart. We saw Sarai's interaction with the truth in which Abraham, I believe, did not communicate clearly. And we asked ourselves some questions. Now Abraham recognized that the Lord and these two men were meeting with him, but the ultimate goal was someplace else. And we're going to see that now as they turn towards Sodom. And if you remember, this man, Lot, went to live with him. We had some foreshadow of this, or lived there next to Sodom and Gomorrah. We had some foreshadow of this. And remember, the kings came in and took people away, and, and um, someone escaped, went to Abraham. Abraham went and delivered them all back. You remember that? There was some foreshadowing there, saying that this place was not a good place, that there was wickedness there. And so we'll see this now come to bear in God's turning towards this place. So verse 16 of Genesis chapter 18 starts this way. When the men got up to leave, okay, they are meeting with Abraham, they got up to leave. They looked down 
towards Sodom, in the direction of Sodom, which tells us this is where they're going, this is what they are going to do. And Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. And we've seen this communicated time and time and time again. So God was asking himself this question, okay, cueing us about this man Abraham. He will surely become what I have called him to do. And all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Including the nations that are now currently on this planet. To those who are of the faith of Abraham, blessing people and opening their homes, and opening their checkbooks, and communicating the good news of the gospel, the promises to this man, which is extended to those who follow in the faith of this man. Verse 19, For I have chosen him. This is significant. For I have chosen him, called him, elected him, pulled him out, and in turn pull us out. Why? So that he and we will direct his children, our children, and his household, our household after us after him to keep the way of the lord that's where i got that phrase to keep the way of the lord how by doing what is both right or righteous and just why so that the lord will bring about for Abraham, what he has promised him. Pause. We're going to pause there. So Abraham, as we know, was called, selected, not on his own merit, but because of God's mercy, called this man to himself and said, I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing to the nations. Gave him precious promises about a promised son, which is foreshadowed to the ultimate promised son, which is Christ Jesus. Made a covenant with him. Abram walked in this uh, covenant. Sometimes he did it well. Sometimes he misstepped along with us, and we sometimes misstepped as well. And God renewed this covenant to him time and time again. The reason that he was called out was to walk or keep the way of the Lord. And if you are a Christian, you have the same calling. Keeping the way of the Lord. And this is not just evidenced by a set of doctrine which is important. What is true about God is important. It's keeping these things locked in the treasure house of our heart and then having that being the center, living them out. How do we do that? Well, of course, loving the Lord our God and loving our neighbor as ourself. Everything hangs on these two things. And in loving God and in loving people, We, as God's children, have a responsibility to do what is right and just. Right and just. This is your calling, and we can only do this because of God's Spirit in us. 
Because God is right and just. He leads us to do what is right and just. This is the way of the Lord. Walk in it. And when we stray, there is an internal homing mechanism in our heart called the Holy Spirit that says, get back on track. Because the farther we get away from what is right and just, which is loving and good, the deeper into darkness we become and we hurt ourselves and hurt other people. And we say amen to that. We are called to be children of the light, which means God, guide us by your Spirit. Your calling as a Christian is to believe things that are true. And then our calling as children is to walk in the way of our Father, who is just and right. So we keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, and pray about it, think about it, what is right in this situation, what is just in this situation. God, help us to be these people. And it's not just in how we live, but we have a responsibility to our children. And we say amen to that. And our grandchildren and our household. Do you see that? Abraham had a calling to believe God's promises and to walk in them. And it wasn't just in his relationship with God. It was to the world and also to those who are following after him. What a privilege it is to be a parent. And we can say amen to that. To be a grandparent, for some of you, great grandparents. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> what a joy. What a gift. And in your household, those that come after you. And by the way, there are people following you. Following in your footsteps. We have a responsibility to God and to those that God is entrusted to our care to train them. And we do this by both demonstration and information. Children often catch more in our demonstration than in our instruction. If you tell your children not to lie, and then you lie, what do you think they're going to do? Thank you. I've had to apologize to my kids. Cranky. Didn't treat them right. And said, I'm sorry, Anna, I'm sorry, Dad. This was, Deborah, this is not okay. What Dad did was wrong. Not only do we demonstrate what is righteous, but we demonstrate humility and forgiveness at times. But we have a responsibility there. And so one of the ways in which we keep the way of the Lord is to help our children and our household do the same. So when we do what is righteous and just, Those things bless the neighborhood and the nation. When you show up to work on time, ready to give it your best, you're doing what is right, you're doing what is just, and you bless your employer. Do you know that? When you... Help to shovel the neighbor's yard when you watch their kids, when you feed their cat. Or whatever. When you help support people in Myanmar. When you teach English as a second language. When you give and you're doing what is right and just, you bless people. 
God's blessing flowed through Abraham as he walked in the way of the Lord. And God's blessing flows through you as you walk in the way of the Lord. You understand this, okay? We do this because God loves us. God loves us, so we love one another. It comes to us, and then it comes through us. I'm not asking you to manufacture these things inside of yourself, but receive who God is, follow Him, ask for His help first to us to transform our heart, and then through us to touch and transform society. You understand how this works, right? And so that's the call to Abraham, and through him the nations were blessed. And God communicated this to him, and God communicates this to us. Keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. The second primary point we see from our text, know, this is something I want you to know, know that God will do what is right and just. It's important truth for us to know. Genesis 18, verse 20. God tells these things about Abraham and tells it to us. And then the Lord said, the outcry against these corrupt places, Sodom, and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Now, it seems like an odd thing for the Lord to say. What is going on here? Is it that he doesn't know their hearts? He already knew what was going to happen. He already knew what was taking place. In response to outcries of people who were crying out for justice, God responds. And he responds by verifying, giving another external opportunity for the people to display the, their heart. He does this through a test. And the test is sending these angels who look like men into the midst of Sodom and Gomorrah to expose the hearts of the people there. God sifts everyone's heart and gives us opportunity to repent or continue to show what's inside of our hearts. Even this place full of wickedness, there is a, another opportunity. And how they respond is a physical, external evidence of what was in their heart. Do you know that God tests your heart as well? Do cranky neighbors, do upset bosses or employees in your relationship with your spouse to the community. All evidence of the internal belief with an out external expression. If you look to Scripture in places like Matthew 25, a passage that Jesus is separating the sheep from the goats, evidenced by how they treated certain disenfranchised, outcast, vulnerable individuals. Read the passage. Matthew 25, 1 Corinthians 3, describes a testing should sober us up. External expression of an internal belief. These things matter. 
So the men, verse 22, turned away. And they went towards Sodom. So the two angels continued to go. And Abraham and the Lord had a conversation. These things sparked in Abraham some thoughts. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, this is a piercing question. A question about God's character. So he asks him, God, will you sweep away both the righteous with the wicked? Are they going to both meet the same fate? Lord, what if in that city there are 50 righteous people? Will you really sweep it away? And not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you, God, to do such a thing. Of all the earth do right. That is a significant statement that brings us both comfort and fear. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? This is a significant question that we ask in particular when we are being done wrong. When bombs are dropping around us. When calamities come into our life at the hands of others and from society, we ask that question. God, will you do what is just and right? Because if we can't trust God to do what is just and right, we all have a problem. And people who don't believe that get anger, angry at God, and they take matters into their own hands. Is this significant and serious question and Abraham was framing it knowing what happened down there knowing the intention of God's thoughts will you God treat both the wicked and the righteous the same will not the judge of all the earth do right Then God answers the question in an interesting way, saying, of course, if there are 50 righteous people in this whole city, he will spare the whole city for their sake. And that's an interesting thought. Us being in this city blesses this city. Do you understand this? God gives mercy to places because people of mercy are in those places places. It's called being both salt and light. Are you familiar with this term? Living for Christ amidst places in which are bent towards evil. By the way, does meat on its own left outside without refrigeration, does it naturally get better or get worse? Worse. Things left on their own decay. Our calling is to shed light and help to impede the decay of our society by doing what is right and just and true. Amen, preacher. Thank you. Thank you. For 50's sake... Reaching out in mercy, I will not spare, spare, I will spare the city. Excuse me. Now, if you continue to read, Abraham continues his questions. And they ask, well, what about 45? And the Lord says, yes, for 45. What about 40? Yes, for 40. What about 30? What about 20? It's like a backwards auction. What about 10? Right? And the Lord says, for the sake of the ten. And Abraham knew that his nephew 
lot was there. What we learn from this is God will deal with people according to what they deserve. Even Putin. And this is where it gets scary for we, this is 2 Corinthians 5, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's no exceptions to this clause. There's no one who kind of escapes to a back alley. All of us must, every single person before the seat, the judgment seat of Christ. Why? So that each one may receive what is due for what he, she has, he or she has done in the body whether good or evil. Now, we know that salvation is based on what Christ has done for us. You cannot earn salvation. Someone say amen right there. We're in Christ. He makes us righteous. And then because we're in Him, we live to serve Him. And what you and I do matters matters. He will be just in his judgment. We see this proclaimed by the angels in Revelation. He is true and just in this judgment. And that's one thing that we should praise God for. So then after this conversation, Christ goes back. The two angels proceed the Sodom, the summation, Genesis 19 to 28. They proceed to Sodom. They go to the city gate. There, Lot is. Lot observes these two men coming in that he does not know. He invites them to come to his house. And these two men say, no, we're going to stay overnight in the city square. Right? Lot says, mm, no, you're not. Mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. That's a bad idea. Right. And it says he encourages or persuades them or basically <laughs> twists their arms and say, no, you're staying with me tonight. So these two angels, looked like men, went to Lot's house. Lot served them a meal, gave them a place for the evening. And then it says all the men of the city... came to the door of his house. Demanding as a unit, as a unified front, demanding what was vile. Okay. And the, the texts here are, they're difficult, but they're true. They wanted to have sex with these men. Because they came as a unit. Demanding that they come out so they could violate them. Lot shut his door, talked to these people, and he asked, offered something that was strange. If you read it, it says, no, don't do anything to these men, but... I have two virgin daughters. Do what you want with them, right? I'm like, what are you doing? And they respond, like, who are you to judge us? So what I believe is happening there, saying, <laughs> I know you don't want these. This is what you, a good sense, desire, regular as men um, desire for women, why, why, why don't you take these? Like, got mad. What are you talking about? We're not interested in your daughters. It's like me as a Vikings fan, someone giving me Packers stuff. I'm not interested in your stinking Packers stuff. 
Or if someone's a dog lover, they'll say, here, why don't you want a cat? You understand what's happening here? There's no, this is wrong. And they continue to insist, we're going to go take them ourselves. Evidence of their heart saying, we're going to do this and you will not get in our way. It got so bad and violent, the angels, these men, grabbed Lot, pulled him in, shut the door, and strike, struck all of these men with blindness. They couldn't see anymore. The first sign of judgment. And they continued to look for the door so great was their twisted lust. Lot understood then how bad this was. And the angels now with this evidence said, Lot, go and get anyone who is connected to you. So Lot somehow escaped out of the back door, went to his daughter's fiancés and said, God is going to destroy this place. We have to leave. And these two young men did not believe him. Whatever, right? And so they remained. Then the angels, the, the sun was coming up because of God's mercy. You'll see this in the text. Because of God's mercy, hurried them from the city. Lot's his wife and his two daughters saying, flee for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to safety in the mountains or you will be swept away. Disconnect yourself from this evil. Then Lot says, I, I'm not going to the mountains. Sort of negotiate, but I'll go to this nearby small village, this small town called Zor. And the angel said, fine, you can go there. And then the text reads, then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. Totally destroyed. And as they were fleeing, Lot's wife turned back. Now this turning back was not just kind of accidentally looking over her shoulders to see what's going on. Jesus talks about her turning back in the context of someone losing their life trying to save their life. She turned back desiring that, desiring that life, desiring, desiring to save her life amidst this evil and all of this debauchery and, and turning back. God's judgment fell on her and she was the first person assaulted by God. Day that was kind of funny. She was turned into a, pol uh, a pillar of salt. This is scary stuff. <laughs> the next morning, we continue to read in the text, Abraham looked up, went to the place where he walked from the Lord, went out, I don't know how far that was, a little while, He saw a dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. At the end, like smoke from a furnace. And at the end of the passage, this is Genesis 19.29, we read this. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham. Circle that. And he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. What do we learn from this? 
God will spare the righteous with his mercy. God spared lots and God will spare us from his justice upon sin because we are in the promised son. His mercy comes in the form of Christ being the shield, being the stronghold, being the safe place, being the joyous oasis in a sea of depravity. It is Christ. God will spare the righteous because of his mercy, not because of our goodness. Do you understand that? He makes us good. That's Christianity. Right? Spares us from wrath. It, wrath comes because he's righteous. Righteousness comes because he's loving. People get this wrong all the time, thinking that God can't be both just or wrathful and loving at the same time. Because God is loving, he has to discipline what is unloving and unright and unrighteous. You understand this? Because it matters. It matters. And we see this from this passage. We can praise God. Thank you for the promise to Abraham, which is extended to this promised son, which is extended to us in believing and being in covenant with this one. Second thing we learn from this, God will strike the wicked with his wrath. That's serious. Those who are wicked in their hearts evidenced by their actions. Judged according to their deeds. There is no such things as, thing as universalism. What that is, by the way, is believing that everyone in the end will be saved. Have you ever heard of a book called Love Wins? Anyone here? Heard that book? It's a way of thinking that everyone in the end will be with God forever in heaven. The plain truth of the Bible is that's not true. It would be great, right? The truth is everyone has an opportunity to be in the mercy of God from the wrath of God in receiving Christ as our Savior and Lord. That's why Jesus matters. Christianity isn't a self-help religion. It's not a way in which you earn your way to heaven Christ paid the price, do you understand? Christ offers us forgiveness because he took upon himself the wrath that is due us on himself. It's called the atonement. <laughs> and whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. Even in the Old Testament, the gospel is encapsulated all over the place. Righteousness, mercy, wickedness, wrath. Your life matters. People may get away with things, but they will not get away with it forever. To give us some comfort, then we continue to do good at and leave room, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, for the wrath of God. Do good, do good, do good. Bless your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. This is our call. Trust God's 
righteousness which should give us comfort and gratitude for His grace and a good, holy honor and fear of God. Fear of God is a good thing. It's a hard thing. Last point. Then we'll transition to communion. There's this kind of afterword to this story. And by the way, Sodom and Gomorrah are seen in the New Testament as examples of God's sudden judgment. Doesn't escape Christ or the Holy Spirit. There's an afterward story that's pretty gross, honestly. And this is the last time we hear from Lot in the Old Testament. The reference to him in the New Testament, Second Peter. This is the point from this passage, and I'll stop with it. Third thing. First, of course, keep the will of the Lord. Keep the way of the Lord. Second, know that God will do what is right and just helps us. Thirdly, know that unrighteous actions will not produce righteous results. And we sometimes think this way. I'm going to give us three examples in just a moment. So if you continue to read, there's this unsavory... He ended up living in a cave. I'm thinking he went to a cave because he was still scared of the school here. And these stories are nobody you know, so don't try to figure these out. Okay. I know that person. You don't. Okay. Had papers. Had to do these papers. And to grade these papers, I'm looking at this paper, I'm like, that student did not write this paper. It's really easy. Have you ever heard of Google? <laughs> Took a part of the paper, put it in Google, said search, and la la, it was another paper. So I had, had a conversation with the student and the student's parents. Sit down, actually Lois Dixon was there. And I started to explain what was going on, and the father got up and got in my face. He was yelling and screaming at me. How dare I call her out? But it wasn't her. Guess who wrote the paper? The dad wrote the paper. He wrote the paper for his kid, thinking that by doing evil, good will result. That was not a pleasant day for me. It wasn't a pleasant day for him either. This was a Christian man. I'm going to do evil because it will help my daughter and good will result. Another instance in conversations that this individual thought, nobody here, that by having an affair it would benefit their marriage. The twisted thought in the mind was, if I do something evil, good will result. Good does not come from evil. Evil does not come from good. Stop deceiving yourself. First church that I was at, a guy was running an illegal business in order to help the church. He literally bought a church building on his own. He's currently in jail right now. I had his kids in my youth group. He had me to start selling cars for him, and I realized he wasn't changing the titles, and it was really shady. But hey, I'll bless you in paying for your biblical education, pastor. This gives us pause. And these are just three out of many stories I could tell about people thinking and doing wrong, good will result from it. Perhaps you think this way in certain areas. My encouragement to you is plead for the mercy of God. Help me to do what is so this is a hard passage today. It's 
in the word and we have to realize it and be at terms with it. So I want us, and this is the takeaway. Okay. Number one, choose to walk in the way of the Lord. Okay. Doing what's right and just. God, help us to do that, and we look to do that. We do this because of the righteous one. Okay. Be grateful of the mercy of God. You're here because of the mercy of God. Do you know that? I'm here because of the mercy of God. Thank God for his mercy through his promise, through his covenant, seen in his son. Know that God is just and righteous. It will be an accounting in the end. Allow that to sink in and live in the love and the fear of the Lord, loving him, looking to honor him. You do it because who you are, not to try to impress God or impress other people. These are people who do what's right regardless if anyone is looking because they love the great king who sees. Oh. Teach your children. Trust in God. Deal with your own heart. How is there a place in which I'm self-deceived? participating in something that I know is shady, doesn't honor you, isn't righteous, and justifying that, thinking, well, you know, good, we'll come from it. Don't deceive yourself. Get clean, get right. It's for forgiveness and trust God to provide you what you need in his time and his way. It's always going to be better. Something for us to think about, be a blessing to the neighborhood, to the nations. So God, here we are this morning, Lord, dealing with, man, this is a hard text. But you put it in your word and you demonstrated this to Abraham and to us. Helping us, instructing us, encouraging us, challenging us, giving us your mercy so grateful that we're in your son, so grateful that he made the covenant in his blood, so grateful for your mercy. Lord, have mercy on our world, have mercy on our hearts, and we thank you for this. You are just, and you are true, and you are righteous. You are good, and you are holy, and you are with us. Heal us, you forgive us, you sanctify us. You are strong. God, may we experience more of you in our hearts, in our world. We say, come, Lord Jesus. We praise you today. Thankful for you today. And God, as we turn towards communion and as we go from this place, keep our hearts soft towards you. Help us to see what you see. Help us to live how you would like us to live. God, we need your help. We need your help. Thank you that you do it in us and through us. May you be praised for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen.